Well, good morning, church. So, this is big church. I'm always over in, in elementary children's church. I didn't really know what this looked like on Sunday morning, hardly ever. It's good to be here today, and we are going to talk about peace, a peace that passes all understanding. And you know what? It's something that the enemy wants to steal from us every single day. So as we talk about this today, I hope that you will um, be able to get some words from the Lord today that will help you with that peace and to be able to walk in that peace that he has for us. Um, we did something really fun this week with kids. Well, first of all, before I tell you about that, let me just say that, you know, in children's church, we do all kinds of things. Like in the middle of everything, we stop and play a game. You up for that today? <laughs> well, maybe next week. I, I don't know. Um, we do things like sometimes I'll throw out candy or we'll throw out beach balls. Or we'll just do all kinds of crazy stuff to keep their attention and get their attention. And I had a, 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 a teenager tell me, well, don't worry, Pastor Shirley, when you speak, those people in that room will be better behaved than they are over here. So I'm kind of counting on that, okay? Because what I have to do over there is when someone's misbehaving, I point at them. I just keep pointing until somebody goes and does something about it. I think they kind of think that something might come out the end of my finger. I'm not sure. They usually kind of stop after I've been pointing for a few minutes. The other thing that often happens is when they get up, I'll say, could you sit down, please? You should have gone before you came in here. I'll try not to do that today if I see you up. Uh, I'll give you the courtesy of going on to the bathroom if you need to go. A lot of times I'll just say, sit down, be quiet, listen up. I know I can rely on you that, to do that today. So I'm excited that we're going to be able to talk about peace. That what, what we saw in our sermon bumper today was exactly what I wanted to talk to you about today. How do, how do we lose our peace? The peace that God gives us when we come to know him as Savior, how do we lose that? What happens in our lives that causes us to lose it? So that's what we're going to talk about. So... Let's see here. They said this was easy. Here we go. There we go. I want to tell you what peace is. The dictionary tells us that peace is freedom from disturbance and that it is quiet and tranquility. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Freedom from disturbance, quiet and tranquility. Having your life just unruffled, undisturbed. Having your... Um, your time at home or wherever you might be, just calm and tranquil. I love that word tranquil. There is just something that comes into my mind. I go to a mountain, sitting in a mountain and a, a brook, a little hearing the water. That just ta That's where I go when I think of what tranquility is. We all have different ideas of that, but the bottom line is God wants to give us a peace that is free of life's disturbances, and it, he wants it to be quiet and tranquil in our lives so that we can walk through and handle whatever may come our way. You know, the world is filled with all kinds of news. I don't know about you, but I get up in the morning, and I may read my Bible and do my prayer time, and I flip on the TV to hear what's going on in the world, and you hear about... Um, a terrorist attack, and you see how many people were slaughtered, or you hear all these terrible things that go on in our world, and it, it can be overwhelming, can't it? It robs us of that joy that we've just come through in our time with the Lord, if we're not careful. It, we, we maybe hear about the financial news, maybe something out of Washington, whatever it might be, we hear these things that just get us. And it begins to chip away at our peace that God wants us to have every single day. It becomes difficult. I moved here I'm, two years ago, starting my third year. And uh, I moved from Charlotte, North Carolina. And the, I served two churches in 20 years that I lived in Charlotte. And the second church I served, I uh, lived 45 minutes away from that church. And I, when I say, I always tell people it took me 45 minutes to get there if all the planets aligned right and if people weren't driving like maniacs. I, or, you know, I got there in 45 minutes from my driveway to where I parked at the church. That's how I measured it. And the bottom line was, is, you know, you get kind of used to that. That sounds kind of crazy to have to drive that far to work, but I got used to it. And I would drive, and, 
And there, after about three or four months of doing that, I got this bright idea that I would turn on the radio, and instead of the idea wasn't as bright as it should have been, I should have had it on the Christian station, but I started listening to talk radio. Now, their job is to get you excited about stuff. And I'm telling you what, it worked with me. By the time that 45 minutes was over, I was yelling at the radio. I was saying, you people are silly and dumb and stupid. And nah, 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 nah. I mean, I was up in arms. I would get there two days a week. We did a huge ladies Bible study there. And I was supposed to do devotions for 35 women every Tuesday and Thursday morning. And I would be like aggravated at the world when I got there. It robbed my peace. I had to stop doing that because I realized that it was not good for me because it chipped away at the peace in my life. We all have situations in life that want to eat away at our peace. It could be your family. You might have something really difficult going on in your family. And you're trying to keep your head above water, but it is difficult. It's very difficult to do that. Or maybe it's something at work. You know, not everyone is as wonderful as you are. So at work, it just gets hard sometimes, isn't it? If they were all just like you, Wait a minute, maybe we better rethink that, hadn't we? You know, but the bottom line is, is maybe it's something at work. Maybe it's relationships with friends. Maybe it's your finances. Something that keeps happening in those things that begin to chip away at, at our peace. It becomes difficult. Can we have peace? Can we have quiet and tranquility? Well, let's look at what John 14, 27 says. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He said, Jesus, the Prince of Peace said, I give you peace. It's yours for the taking. It's yours to have with you from now on, forever and always. I give you that peace. I don't give it like the world gives. The world dangles things in front of us. He said, I don't give it that way. I give you peace that the world doesn't give. And then he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Trust in me. That's what he wants us to do. Because our peace lies in accepting what he's done and what he's given for us. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, said, I give you peace. Why do we ever walk around without it? He's given it to us as a free gift. As believers, can we have peace in the midst of chaos and pressure? John 14 said we could. But you know what? We have to make a choice every single day to live in that peace. We have to choose to live in peace. Choice is part of life, isn't it? It becomes a part of life. And so one of the choices that we have to make is choose to come to God first. We need to, when life's pressures come in and our peace is being disrupted, instead of running to your spouse, running to your best friend, running to someone that is a great confidant and can give you such words of wisdom sometimes, instead of all that, why is it we don't go to God? Why don't we go to God first? Why don't we run to Him first? Why don't we go to Him and say, God, here I am. Things, this stuff is trying to mess with my peace. Why don't we do that? You know, I've discovered, and I, I, I know because I do it, I talk things to death. Talk, talk, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and then start over again and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. What does that do for us? Does it make things better? No. It makes it bigger. It makes it bolder. It makes it stand out more in our lives. God said we need to come to him. We need to run to him. Listen, look at this scripture. Psalm 102, 17 says, He will respond to the cry of the destitute, and he will not despise their plea. He will respond to the cry of the destitute. Now listen, that word destitute means bottom of the, of the rung, down to the very floor, bankrupt, depleted of everything. He will respond to the cry of the destitute. And he will not despise their plea. He loves to hear your voice. He wants to have you come to him first. When the world is chipping away at your peace, he wants you to come to him first. So life is full of choices. So first, we need to choose.
to come to God. Um, I, you know, when you prepare stuff like this, you all of a sudden have big pictures of how you've messed up. <laughs> and so I was thinking about about three or four months ago, I was talking to a friend of mine and just telling her about some things. And, you know, and I said, you know, we've been praying, but, but. <laughs> and she said, um, well, you probably need to pray more. And I said, yeah, you're probably right about that. Probably do need to pray more. And, we, and then she began to tell me about her stuff things that were going on, and this was her comment. She said, you know, it dawned on me that I was not desperate enough for God. I hadn't gotten desperate enough for God. When she said those words, it was like a, 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 a knife went into my heart because I realized what I'd been doing is I'd been going, God, will you please fix this pretty please, pretty please, and then I'd run on about my business. I wasn't interested in staying before him, being desperate to see his eyes, to see his hands, to be able to touch me, I was interested in getting my cry out and then running on. We need to go to God first, and we need to be destitute or desperate in our plea for him. There's other choices that we can make. And so another one would be, choose to set our mind on God's Word. It's a choice that we make. When things start coming to us, we have lots of choices. We can get mad, we can stomp our foot, we can put our hand on our hip, and we can raise our hand toward God and tell Him what for. But a choice that we can make is to also to go to set our mind on God's Word. When we begin to look at all kinds of things. There's all kinds of books out there. If you've gone into a, a bookstore like Barnes & Noble or any place like that or looked at books on Amazon, there's hundreds and thousands of self-help books. People telling you how to do it, how to feel better, how to, how to win at life, how to all these things. They're telling you what to do and how to do it. Those things only last for a minute. Motivational speakers are great. Those things only stay with us for the moment. But God's Word is always there for us. His Word is always there for us. And when we not only choose to come to God first, but then we choose to set our mind on His Word, then we will begin to find out the answers. Why is my peace slipping away? Why am I having troubles right now? We can find those answers in God's Word. We can find them there. Um, God's Word is powerful. It's mighty. The Word tells us His Word is as sharp as a two-edged sword. It can, do, it can bring to us the answers of life. And you know, when we get into His Word, something happens. We begin to know the character of God. When you know the character of God, you know who He is. You are able to understand more and be able to walk more freely in the ways that He wants you to walk. The bottom line is, is we need to set our mind on God's Word. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep them in perfect peace, those whose minds are steadfast, steadfast, uh, because they trust in you. You will keep them in perfect peace. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we need? The perfect peace of Christ in our lives every single day, regardless of what's going on. We have to choose to set our minds on Him. We have to have, we have to, in looking for that perfect peace, we have to keep our minds focused on him. Any of you have a focus problem? Anybody? Yeah. You know, one of the things I've discovered, we can focus on things that we're really, we're really into, can't we? If you're a baseball fan, I don't know. Should we say Texas Rangers? I don't know. If you're a baseball fan and you're really into them, you really know what's going on with them, and you pay attention and you focus in, and when that ball game is on the TV or the radio or whatever, you are watching it. You are focused in on what's going on. You're yelling at players to do better right there from your living room. You're into it because you're focused on it. We need to be that focused on God's Word. We need to be able to focus our hearts and our minds on God's Word. You know, He is His Word. He is completely 100% His Word. Jeremiah 1.12 says that He is watching over His Word in order to perform it. He wants you to come to Him and then to stand on His Word because when you stand on His Word, He goes into action. So, God wants us to 
choose to set our minds on, on God and on his word. Then he wants us to choose to trust him no matter what. No matter what. You know what? It's really easy to trust when there's money in the bank, when your job's going along great. It's easy to trust when there's no ripples in the family. It's easy to trust when everyone's in good health. It, there's just times in life it's really easy to trust. But it's the times that aren't so easy that he wants us to say, no matter what, I choose to trust in him, no matter what. Those are easy words until we're confronted with it, isn't it? They're easy to say until it's time for us to step up and to do that. When life requires more of us than being able to talk ourselves into something. Choose to trust him no matter what. Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust him and he will act. Commit your ways. So when you commit and you add trust to that, then what happens? What happens? He will act. When we commit and we trust, he will act. Um, I, I had a little aunt that lived in White Deer for 40 some odd years, well, maybe longer than that, I'm not really sure. She, uh, her name was, I called her Aunt Marcy, and she was without doubt <clears throat> one of the sweetest women I'd ever met. And she always had a big smile on her face, she always had a good things to say about people. I honestly do not remember ever in my life ever hearing her say a negative word about anybody. It just wasn't even in her thought process to do that. And as I got older, I began to understand that she had a really rough life. You know, when you're a kid, you don't, you don't notice it. But as I got older, I began to understand what a rough life she had. Aunt Marcy married a man that, um, he was a nice man, but he had mental illness. And in those days, he was bipolar and he was schizophrenic, so he heard voices and he, um, his mood swung a lot. And in those days, the treatment was worse than the illness, really, I believe, in understanding a little bit more about it now. And so that was a big problem in their home, but she never let it overwhelm her. Somehow... She kept her head above that water all the time. She had four children. They had four children and two boys and two girls. They were all older than I was. I, I was the baby of every family gathering. Uh, I, was, I had older brothers and I was a surprise. And so long came, you know, I was always the baby in every situation. But as I got, as I watched what happened in their family, as I got older, one of the cousins who looked like the picture of health, had a massive coronary and dropped dead at, I want to say, 29 or 30. Her other son was killed in a, a bad car accident. One of her daughters was mentally ill, ended up in an institution, died there. So her life was not easy. It wasn't easy at all. And so I remember one time, I was probably about 18 or 19, I said to my mom, Mom, how does Aunt Marcy always seem so happy and look so happy. And how does she do, what, what is that? And I, my mom did a very smart thing. She said, well, I think that what you ought to do is the next time you see her, you ought to ask her about it yourself. You ought to hear from her what she has to say. So that's what I did. Next time I saw her, I asked her all about it. Aunt Marcy, your life's been rough. How, how, how do you remain so happy and upbeat? And I'll never forget that she looked me straight in the eyes and she said, because I have the peace of God that passes all understanding. That's what I've got. And she said, yeah, things aren't always easy. Things can be rough. But the bottom line is I've got his peace and I choose to walk in that. And I thought, what wisdom that is. And all that can go on in our lives, if we will make a choice to trust in God and to allow his peace to remain in our hearts and spirits and not let the world steal it away from us, then we can have that peace that passes all understanding. The next thing that we need to do, choice that we need to make, is we need to choose to pray in each circumstance and be specific. 
I really truly believe that many of us are guilty of play, praying blanket prayers. We get up in the morning and we say, dear God, thank you for this day. Help me make it through my day. Bless all the missionaries. Bless all the people that are sick. Bless my family. Amen. And we run on our way. Well, there's, that's, that's okay. But there comes, needs to be a time when situations and circumstances are urgent enough in our life that we get serious about praying, praying about that circumstance, calling out the, the situation as it is, details, on and on, so that we will be able to reach him and let him know. You know what? He knows all about it. But it's good for us to go to him with those things and pray in complete um, spe specificity toward him. He knows what needs to happen. You don't need to tell him. He knows what needs to happen. But we need to take that time and to spend that time in prayer and be specific when we pray and pray about each circumstance. The scripture um, is Colossians 4.2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer. Some of you are very devoted to different things. You're, you really are passionate about something. You care about that. It's, it's a hot button for you, and you're, you, you love it, and so you devote yourselves to it. That can happen. Some people, I'm not sure they're devoted to much of anything. But the bottom line is, he says here, Colossians, Paul tells us to devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Well, I have people tell me all the time, I have a hard time praying for more than about 10 minutes. I understand. I really, truly do. It's hard. Because, I don't know, when you sit down and you get down before the Lord and you begin to pray, don't you, ladies, don't you think about, oh, I need to put the clothes in the dryer. Or men, you think, oh, I need to mow the lawn. Usually that's the last thought on your mind, I'm sure. But when you get down to pray... It becomes really forefront there for that moment, isn't it? Because the enemy doesn't want you to build a relationship. He doesn't want you to be deep in prayer there with the Lord. He doesn't want that to happen. He doesn't want that to happen. So the bottom line is we need to devote ourselves to prayer. How do we do that? Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to give you a way to pray. What did he give them? The Lord's Prayer. He gave them the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's how we should start off every time we pray. Father, you are holy. You are mighty. You are powerful. We can, be, we can use the model of the Lord's Prayer. You'll be surprised if you'll break down every phrase of the Lord's Prayer, how long you'll be able to spend in prayer before the Lord. You may need to make a list. If your memory's like mine, you need to make a list of who you need to pray for. And you call their name out. It could be situations you know about other people. Whatever it might be, we are supposed to be devoted to prayer, to be watchful, and then to be thankful. Another choice that we can make is choose not to be anxious. Now, that is really easier said than done, isn't it? To choose not to be anxious, oh my goodness, when things start happening that rattle our world, to have the, the wits about you to say, stop, I'm not going to be anxious. Sometimes it just seems impossible, doesn't it? Anything that we think is worth doing, if we're going to do it well, we have to keep working at it and practicing at it and making the choice, I choose not to be anxious. I make that choice. I'm not going to be anxious. You know, um, this, we're going to look at Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And I love this scripture because it says, Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. So now let's look at this. He said, do not be anxious for what? What is it? Yes, I'm not going to call you down for talking. Do not be what? Anxious for what? Anything. That's right. And yet, I think there are some of us who read that scripture and we say, do not be anxious for anything, parentheses. 
except when my child has 103 fever, uh, except when I've gotten bad news, except when it looks like my job is going under. You know, we put parentheses and put our own little things out to the side. It's not there, is it? The scriptures say, do not be anxious for anything. Listen, I I've never had an anxiety attack, but I hear they're terrible. I, I hear they're absolutely awful. I hear your body, you begin to sweat profusely. You, um, your heart begins to race really hard. Your mind is just going berserk that you cannot get control of yourself. To, if you're standing up, you can't sit down. If you're laying down, you can't get up. That your whole body get, just kind of goes berserk at that moment. I, I wouldn't want that for anyone. And I'm not making light of that if that's something in your life. But we have to make choices in life at certain points in time. And we have to say, I choose to not be anxious. If I want God's peace in my life, if I want to have that peace flooding my life every single day, when the, when the thought runs through my mind, uh-oh, you're in trouble here. You have to say, wait a minute, I choose not to be anxious. I know it's easier said than done, but we have to make those kind of choices as believers. He has given us what we need to live a godly and a holy and a peace-filled life. And we have to accept it and choose to not believe the things that the enemy wants to come at us against and how he wants to chip away at our peace. We have to make those choices. Be anxious. Do not be anxious for anything. It's not easy, but we have to do it. We have to make up our mind that when it happens, that we'll say, wait a minute, I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to think about who he is. Uh, um, Isaiah 9 said, he, he is, um, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be the almighty God, the everlasting peace, the, uh, the prince of peace, the everlasting father. That's who he is. When we begin to say, wait a minute, the word tells me that he is everything I have need for in this life. The word tells me is that he is not a man that he would lie. The word tells me that every promise is for me. When we begin to rely on those things and believe those things, God, we can learn to be and choose to not be anxious when our mind goes there instead of the other direction. So choose not to be anxious. Now look, look at this. No God equals no peace. If I don't have an ongoing relationship with God, if I don't have something that happens between Sunday and Sunday, there is no God in my life and there will be no peace. You can't live on yesterday's blessing. You need a fresh one every day. So when there is no God, there is no peace. But look at that next line when it says, no God, K-N-O-W. When you know God, when you know him as Savior, as healer, as redeemer, when you know him, you will know peace. You have to tap into that every single day to know God and to know peace. There are three or four more that I want to do. But guess what? I'm going to do them next week. <laughs> so don't get anxious. I was going to tell you earlier that I only had eight and we were going to spend about 20 minutes on each one of them. So good news. I'm getting ready to wind up here for today. But the bottom line is we have choices that we can make that will help us that we can live that life of peace that Christ died on the cross for. He died on the cross for those things. So our choices are that we come to God first that we set our minds on God's word, that we trust him no matter what, that we pray in each circumstance and be specific in those prayers, and that we are not to be anxious, that we choose not to be anxious. When we do those things, church, when we make those choices in the hard times, in the difficult times, when it seems like there's no peace left in our lives, when we begin to make these choices, 
God will begin to restore that peace back into your life and back into your spirit. And that's what, what our Savior wants for you. That's what he wants for you. He wants for you to live every single day a peace-filled life. So I want us to go to the Lord in prayer, and I want you to begin to think about, are you walking in that? Is your life full of the drama of life that has overwhelmed you? Have you asked the Lord into your heart? You might be in that place where you've never even done that, and you say, I wouldn't know what peace is. Listen, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He can give us a peace that passes all understanding. He can help us through the difficult times of life, and we, can, we won't necessarily sail through some of life's problems, but we can still walk through them with the peace of Christ that passes understanding. Father, I thank you that your word is true and that you have come to give us a peace that passes understanding. You've come to give us life and give us abundant life. And in that life of, of walking with you, we can experience peace every single day. So I pray, oh God, that anyone that is sitting here today that is not experiencing your peace, I pray, oh Lord, that you would help them, that they would be able to make choices that would help them get back to where you want them to be, walking in the peace of the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, we give this time to you, and we ask you, Father, that you would speak to our hearts and that you would help us, that we would reach out and receive what you have for us in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the prayer teams to come forward. And if you are here today and you are saying, you know what, I, I haven't ever asked Jesus into my heart and you need to do that, there will be someone that you can pray with. If you are struggling with all kinds of life circumstances and you realize I've lost my peace, I need some help here. I would ask you, come forward and come and pray with one of these people so that, they, so that you can walk out of this place today knowing that your peace is being restored moment by moment. Thank you, Lord. We just wait on you, Father. Wait on you to speak to us. And in these moments, Lord, we just say, Father, we know that you want to give us peace. So, Father, we just sit here, we wait. We say, Lord, restore what the enemy has tried to steal. Help us, Lord. Thank you.